Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on today's show. Uh, this is VCTV and you're with me, Terence. Before we start the show, it's going to be an interesting show. We're going to talk a little bit on factory farming and agri-tech. And we're going to see what gets uh, around the ecosystem. And we try to bring up lots of things. And today on the panel, you see our investors, the people involved in the business, and also those who are currently engaged with some of the companies out there. So again, for all of you viewing out there, if you want to join us on the show, you have the opportunity to come on. You have the opportunity to even pitch your idea as well. Do get in touch with us. There's many ways to do it. Our links are below. You can speak directly to the investors. You can get in touch with me and we can start to plug you into the show as well. And just a little bit more housekeeping. Before we start the show, from wherever you are, from wherever channels that you're watching us, do just bookmark, like us, encourage us, give us some comments, tell us what you think, what we can improve on the show, and we'll try to incorporate it in. So without further ado, I'm going to start by introducing the panel itself. I'm going to go around and have them introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start with William. William, tell us about yourself and the companies that you represent. Uh, thanks, Terence. Hi, good evening all. My name is uh, William Du. Today, I'm representing Agros Group. Agros Group is a vertical farm uh, that started a few months ago in uh, Kuala Lumpur. As you can see from uh, my the virtual background, this is a shot taken uh, at around noon today. So uh, we have been harvesting the... Uh, this is the third harvest already, okay? So the, the container actually uh, set foot in KL, okay, on 6th of November. And in just less than or exactly two months' time, we have our third harvest, okay? So, yeah, I look forward to share with you uh, the exciting adventures that I have been on for the last uh, three months. All right, great. Thank you, William. And welcome on the show. Happy New Year as well. Uh, Tusha, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Terence, for having me on the show again. And great to be a part of this panel with Gary and William and uh, Carol in the background. So uh, my, my name is Tushar Kansal. I run two companies. One is Consultancy Ventures and the other one is Saffron First. Saffron First is an angel network oblique fund uh, with around 38 high net, net worth individuals. We, we invest across technology, agri-tech, space tech, food tech, uh, AIML, health tech, uh, and so on. Consultancy Ventures is a investment bank which helps uh, startups and growth stage companies in mergers and acquisitions, debt, and venture capital. Happy to be here. My my background has been uh, in Deloitte and Touche, India's largest uh, venture capital fund, Brand Capital, and I've also raised uh, two and a half billion dollars of debt for MTS India, the Systemas, uh, the Russian company Systemas mm -hmm. India unit and have been CFO with uh, DLI, that's a company owned by Guggenheim Partners. So happy to be on this show today. Yeah, great. Thank you for that introduction, Tusha, and welcome on the show as well. And happy new year if I didn't wish you yet. <laughs> Gary, over to you. For yeah, those who sure. don't know who you are, Gary. <laughs> I don't know who I am, come on. <laughs> I feel like Rodney Dangerfield is a yeah. comic from a long time ago. I get no respect. Anyhow, my name is Gary Fowler. I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, I've done 17 companies. I've been involved in two unicorns. I actually co-founded EVA, an uh, award-winning uh, AI HR tech company with a billionaire from Russia, David Yang, who now lives in Silicon Valley. And also I was on the original management management team of Click Software, mm -hmm. an Israeli company that we took to an IPO and then sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion. And I was the senior vice president of marketing and business development at that time, named the company, et cetera, came up with the product family. So love artificial intelligence. I'm also currently the CEO, president, and co-founder of GSD Get Shit Done Venture Studios, we curate AI companies from around the world and help them go global, to go global, using Silicon Valley as support. So I'm an investor, I'm an entrepreneur, and the whole idea is, you know, helping companies go from being a regional player to dominating their space on a global basis. So 
that's where we are. I write a lot. I've written 107 articles uh, in the last year, uh, mostly about artificial intelligence. And But my next one coming out in Forbes is about uh, AI and quantum computing. Mm. Right. I think uh, we saw that as well, Gary. And thank you for all that contribution. I'm sure some of your readers and your fans are also on the show today. But again, I think uh, those who are focusing on this show today have that direct interest either within the ecosystem or just contributing to the ecosystem. So kind of let's give them something to kind of look forward to and talk about as well. Uh, so I think just to kind of start off, uh, we want to talk about basically factory farming and then moving towards agritech and then moving towards what's next. I mean, you see in the news today, you, there's lots of issues with growing demographies, uh, scarcity of food, there's climate change. And then there's one part of the world is food waste. So there's people starving and there's people wasting food. So there's a number of global trends going on. And that's kind of putting a dent in this overall sustainability of the whole agriculture system. So I think it's just, just that we kind of talk about the current state of the whole agriculture ecosystem itself. I think, William, uh, let's start with you on this one. Give us a little bit on some of the trends that you see and even maybe talk about the current state of where we are at the moment. All right, thanks, Terence. Yep. Okay, so the, just uh, talk about four months ago, we always hear about ESG, we always hear about sustainability, food security, food safety, okay? So I think the, uh, for the last uh, three to four months, is a, a new learning curve for myself, okay? And uh, we went into the vertical farming, okay, to actually uh, meet those requirements, okay? Uh, as you mentioned, as Terence mentioned about sustainability, how to ensure that uh, the whole ecosystem, okay, in every culture, and also uh, the the entire delivery from farm to your plate, okay, and where they call it sometimes farm to fork, okay. So how do you ensure that uh, the entire process is well taken care of, okay, in to to have the right uh, uh, safety and security concerns? So if you look at COVID nineteen, okay a lot of uh, issues has cropped up, okay, like uh, Terence mentioned just now, in certain parts of the world, uh, people are dying of hunger, right? In certain parts of the world, there's excess, okay? So how do you mitigate uh, this uh, imbalance, okay? So uh, from our perspective, okay, uh, in Malaysia itself, we are actually uh, importing 30% of our fresh produce, okay, be it uh, vegetables or fruits, okay? So without going out, just in Malaysia alone, we want to to, to actually uh, close that gap, okay? And uh, being in a closed environment that where you see the virtual background, this is in a 40 foot container, okay? Everything inside here is controlled. And because of that, we do not have any issues of uh, pests, or pollution, okay, be it air or be it water. So everything is controlled in here. We even have a water tank uh, in-house, okay? So this is uh, our first uh, project. Okay, starting with the container farm, and uh, we just signed on a new uh, lease uh, to start a 3,000 square feet of uh, vertical farm. Okay, and we are also looking at uh, building Malaysia's largest uh, uh, in the first half, by the first half of 2021, uh, by building a 90,000 square feet. Okay, so by doing this, we are able to, to provide to the food, uh, food chain in Malaysia. Right. right. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for that, William. And uh, I think we're going to touch a little bit more on, on the business and how things are done as well in Malaysia. Tusha, yeah. over to you with this one. Uh, tell us a bit about uh, India, perhaps. Uh, talk to us about some of the trends that you see and, and the current agricultural system at the moment. So uh, agriculture has been the oldest profession of, uh, you know, in any civilization. Uh, in India itself, uh, uh, this whole area around India and within India is very, very fertile land. And 52% uh, of land in India is uh, arable. And uh, more than 50% of uh, India's population is a farmer. So, you know, if I put it in the right perspective, 8% uh, of global population is an Indian farmer. So, the, you know, these uh, this uh, particular sector 
can move governments can change governments it and it's very very uh, sensitive to climate change so you know uh, i was uh, reading recently that uh, water has been added as a commodity on uh, Sh- uh, chicago mercant- uh, mercantile exchange so you know this is uh, this shows the potents of things to come i mean this year in the mekong uh, delta region we had the droughts and uh, they, and the productivity of the farmland was very low uh, so you know uh these are this is a very sensitive sector and hence there is an opportunity for startups and investors to invest and uh, uh use technology to bring out better outcomes uh within india a lot of action has happened uh, in the last 6 uh, months uh, in this space so we used to have uh, monopolies of uh, in the form of uh, uh, market produce committees which has been taken away and now the farmer is free to sell his produce uh, wherever they want to contract farming has been um, allowed uh, in the country and uh, there have been uh, an internet based uh, marketing mechanism called enam which has been created so the farmer can sell the produce on the internet uh, and you know so, so you know the, the agriculture in india has been uh, prone to a lot of problems uh, like uh, lack of scale low productivity and uh, no post harvest value addition but given uh, i you know the potential can be gauged from the fact india has more arable land than the us the us exports 140 billion dollar of agriculture uh, products every year india exports 39 billion dollars so this this mm-hmm. shows uh, why there are 450 agri tech startups in india as of now and it's growing at more than 50% every year Mm. Right. I think I think I can echo that as well. And Gary, uh we want to hear from yourself as well and your part of the world. Uh I'm sure I'm sure we can all agree that the whole agriculture industry is facing several challenges. Uh can we talk about some of the challenges that you see uh which is uh kind of sweeping the states almost? Yes, yeah, so I mean look at it Terence. The population of the world is has uh, quadrupled in the last 100 years. Mm. So we've gone to 2 billion to about 8.1 billion people on the planet. So think about how much less uh, potable water, uh how much less land we have. At the same time, you know, I was involved in a uh, weather startup uh, many years ago and I happened to have the pleasure of working with a 80-year-old um professor who was actually a student of Einstein at Princeton. Dr. Irving Crick, one of the foremost private weather weather forecasters in the world. So I spent about 9 months with him. And we talked about what kind of impact. Think about since about 1880 the temperature in the world has gone up 1 degree centigrade. Well, we say that that's not that much, but if we look at it, the kind of impact in a place like Florida could be mm. with the polar ice caps melting uh and temperatures rising that the sea levels could go up uh up to 2 feet. right mm. uh, above sea level 2 feet that's enough so if you look at it that's enough to to basically take most of the coastlines of uh, all of the coastlines of Florida and submerge them Co- you know cities like Miami may no longer be on the map and we're experiencing this all over the world one thing Dr. Crick told me she said that when the gulf stream slows down because of the warming trends the food supply starts to change and he said The other thing he said when it snows and and I believe Einstein also said it when it snows in the UK right and if you look recently we had snow why because the uh gulf stream warms up the UK so we've got a lot of challenges out there not to say that we can't address them and look at the beauty of it so uh in India for the first time in the last 30 years you've been able to see the Himalaya mountains So we understand that we can have an impact. This pandemic on one side has dramatically shifted the way we live our lives. At the same time, it's given us hope because we understand that, you know, by not driving around and by by not polluting and harming the planet, we're able to cleanse it. It's cleansing itself. So mm. that's where the hope comes. And then at the same time, look at the uh, electric cars uh that are coming on, electric farm tractors, um etc. Look how it's changing things. So in terms of where I see it in terms of the you know we've got technologies out there today that we need to go down through and 
really uh, to understand some trends. So what kind of trends do I see? So driverless tractors, we're working with a group that's got driverless tractors. So what are tractors going to look like in the future? Well, they're going to be able to be deployed. They're going to be smaller than they are today, and they're going to be able to work in, in swarms. Drones. So farmers, you know, if you look at it, farming's really been a, a non, for the most part, right? We've, we've changed a lot with corporate farms over the last 50 years, but for the most part, you know, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I was a farm boy. <laughs> we had cows, we had chickens, we had pigs, you know, mm. you go out and detassel the corn, but now look at it, drones. So it's, they're not just pricey toys anymore. Farmers are using drones with sensors and digital imaging technology. And as they're soaring over the land, they're getting a detailed picture of the fields to be able to understand what needs to be, what, where, and how it needs to be done. So they can add the herbicide or fertilizer, that kind of thing. And these, these images can also show farmers where they've overgrown areas of crops, right? And where it's thin and out, et cetera. So a view of what's happening on their farm, which they've never had before. So mm -hmm. using GPS or um, um, other systems to be able to understand where that machine needs to be exactly on that farm at what particular time. So... Uh, crop editing. And I've written an article recently in Forbes about um, uh, gene splitting, well, well, gene editing the crops by adding some genes and removing uh, some, you'll be able to turn on specific uh, traits. So you want a, 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 a tomato that's larger, that's sweeter. You know, we have the ability to be able to engineer those kind of uh, uh, technologies. And the other thing is uh, <clears throat> the, the ability to be able to breed crops with traits like, you know, they're not, so some people are hyper allergic to particular uh, prop food groups. Imagine being able to take those out. Imagine a, being able to change the uh, disease resistance. And of course, a blockchain, right? So blockchain is there, the security of the uh, security and, and the ability for uh, food safety in particular. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think you're right with that, Gary. You're you're right in terms of disrupting the whole system itself. Now that that is possible with new technology, and we have seen the advent of sensors, drones, and so on and so forth. And I think this question to you, William, uh, since you are also involved in a business uh, and you are in that control environment. Talk to us a bit about some of the technologies that are now being mainstreamed at the moment. Okay, uh, our farm is built on a very simple principle. Okay, the technology is an enabler. So we focus on how to produce the best vegetable with the best taste. Okay, and of course, mm -hmm. with the best nutrition. Okay, so if you talk about technology, of course, you can see in the background, we have the most advanced LED. Okay, developed in China, which is used worldwide now. Okay, they have a joint venture uh, in the US as well. They're listed uh, in uh, China. If you look at the container or the white color that house our vegetables, okay, that's good, great material. Okay, and um, the nutrient that goes uh, into the system, okay, from our two uh, control tanks at the back of the container, okay, that is uh, organic nutrient, okay, that goes through the system. Okay, so and if you look at the entire control environment, okay, so we, uh, like Gary mentioned just now, is uh, blockchain. So blockchain play an important role. We have already started uh, uh, on that, okay? So all the data, all the temperature, humidity, everything is recorded because we want to learn, okay, using what kind of uh, uh, mixture of nutrient, combining the amount of uh, lights, okay, and the temperature will produce what kind of results. All right. So for the first, uh, the last three months, okay, the, we estimated that our first harvest will be in five weeks, okay. Uh, but because we try our best, okay, because we are learning along the way as well, we try to give more, okay. And in fact, uh, it turns out that within we uh, with just uh, three and a half weeks, we are able to have a full half, first harvest already, okay. Mm. In fact, if uh, if we follow our so-called uh, research, it's supposed to be five weeks. And that one and a half weeks uh, of saving per harvest will translate to 
probably 10 times, uh, you see 1.5 weeks, okay, uh, savings, okay. So, and uh, because of the control environment, we do not need to use any pesticide or any uh, 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 precaution on all this because everything, okay, is, uh, is taken care of, okay. So the technology behind it, uh, I will, uh, probably I will, sh I, will, I will need my CTO to share with you uh, in the next uh, 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 show, but from the business perspective, okay, uh, from, from our uh, long-term perspective, we want to make sure that all our produce are of highest quality, okay, that uh, with the highest uh, with the, uh, possible uh, nutrient mix, and also we need to meet the market demand. Okay, mm. so in Malaysia, we import a lot of uh, vegetables, especially if you look at kale and uh, if you look at fruits. Okay, so one of our key crops will be kale, all right, uh, mm. that goes into uh, uh, most of the dishes. Okay, another one is microgreens. So in Malaysia, if you don't have that uh, control environment, you can't, you can't go uh, into big uh, scale farming. Okay, certain crops are not suitable uh, in our climate. Okay, that's why in Malaysia we have Cameron Highlands. Okay, but the problem with Cameron Highlands uh, for the last uh, few days is the entire, almost the, most of the, the state, okay, is flooded. Okay, so there's, uh, there's landslides, okay, uh, there's potholes all over the place. So uh, there goes uh, the distribution system, right? So doing vertical farm, we solve that issues of uh, inconsistency due to weather, due to floods, okay? And uh, we want to be near to urban. That's why the, our first uh, farm is actually in uh, mines, okay? Uh, actually 15 kilometers away from the Twin Towers, okay? And we are next to a uh, north-south highway, okay? So here we have, uh, if we go south three hours, we can reach Singapore. If we go north few hours, we can reach uh, Penang. So along the way, we can actually serve a lot of uh, population with our uh, produce. Okay, that's, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's great actually. That's great news, and that shows that technology is definitely disrupting the whole system. So that's oh, yeah. basically agriculture 4.0 for you. Uh, Tusha, over to you. Uh, there has been a lot of buzz in the whole agritech space in India as well. Could you tell us more about it, Tusha? Yeah, uh, so there has been a focus in uh, on removing middlemen. So removing the intermediaries and connecting the farm to families directly. Uh, so, you know, in the agronomy uh, space, which is the doorstep delivery, uh, we have a lot of uh, action happening. Uh, it's around a $15 billion sector. The company, the startup which has come up there is called AgroStar, which is doing quite well. The other one is uh, the farms to consumer. It works like a consumer brand. Uh, it's the largest component of Agritech and uh, it's related to outputs and market linkages. Ninja Cart and Clover are two companies here which are doing quite well. Ninja Cart is a tech driven supply chain platform and Clover is a greenhouse grown uh, farm produce which uh, is channeled to consumers uh, via B2C or B2B channels. Then mm -hmm. third is precision agriculture. Uh, it's not the full stack sol solution, but specific tech intervention. So we have, uh, uh, you know, it's around a $10 billion sector. Uh, Fasal is a company which is an AI powered SaaS platform for horticulture, which is one company which is doing quite well here. And the fourth is life sciences, uh, basically power and capabilities uh, of big data and data science, like alternate proteins. Uh, coming to specifics, uh, we, I have seen uh, agritech uh, startups in demand-led cultivation, in managed farm networks, uh, in uh, some unique ones, like there was a startup which converts floral waste into charcoal-free uh, luxury incense products. And these incense products are actually used a lot in temples out here. Then there are B2B mm -hmm. marketplaces. Uh, there is rural fintech, very important rural fintech. You know, I take the example of Jack Ma, who had uh, used technology to such an extent that he captured one third of the Chinese uh, population and his company was valued at $3 trillion. I mean, that kind of uh, revolution we have yet to see in uh, the Indian rural fintech space, but, uh, but this space has a huge requirement uh, in terms of credit access to farmers. Then there's food processing because we are a consumption led economy. So food processing is very important and a lot of food goes waste, which 
uh, can be converted into better outcome uh, for uh, the consumer and uh, so a lot of these startups are actually focusing on top 20% of the farmer which uh, you know who who actually owns more than 50% of land and uh, because that is the farmer with uh, which has a good paying capacity so uh, uh, on afforestation i've seen a company which is using drones to uh, drop seeds and uh, do afforestation and you know the example is of course japan which is uh, had a successful very successful afforestation uh, program since uh, since a long time also um, mm-hmm. there was a startup uh, which is delivering 100% organically grown uh, fruits and vegetables to doorstep within 12 hours so you know it is a very hyper local kind of uh, uh, kind of operation and uh, then you know these are some of the companies and there are 450 agritech startups and growing at more than 40% so very exciting space Right, right. right, right. Uh, you're right. Uh, we've been looking at that as well, and it's always in the news. Uh, Gary, uh, over to you for this one. Uh, as an investor, as a successful business person yourself, why is agritech important as a sector to you and your peers? I mean, are you actively looking at it? Yeah, absolutely. Because, well, you know, Terence, we have to eat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm a country boy from Pennsylvania. We're back to basic. We have to eat. And yeah. so I mean the, the you know as I said the population of the world is increasing and the food supplies I mean look what's happened during this pandemic, right? Where our food supplies, you know, we had significant challenges. Why? Because one is, you know, restaurants couldn't weren't using food, so food got wasted. I mean we couldn't even get toilet paper and still can in California. It happened again, right right now. Mm. And so we understand that we've got challenges with the food supplies. So from the time that it's grown on the farm to the time it gets into the store and to the restaurant, we need to go down through and streamline that process. So is it easy? Uh, no. And you know, from my standpoint, if you look at it, look at the technologies that I talked about earlier. So driverless tractors, right? We're involved in, in a company that does uh, driverless tractors. I mean, this is how you can really revolutionize what happens. Imagine the swarm of these small tractors being able to be allocated at a specific time. Imagine using an unsupervised artificial intelligence that actually will, with sensors throughout the field that'll say this particular field needs this type of potassium for inches mm, mm. and it needs to be delivered and the farmer doesn't even have to go out and deliver it it's automatic delivered uh through the farm out to that field imagine how that really streamlines the service i mean it's you didn't you used to have that kind of real-time data and using artificial intelligence to analyze that data makes some incredible decisions very quickly imagine farm to farm communication imagine having um these tractors out there that would deal with 10 farms and not one, being able to deploy it across multiple farms at any one point in time. Look how much money that could save, almost like a time sharing service, right? Where you go down through and it's, uh, you know, the farm indicates uh, it needs particular uh, potassium or nitrates and allocates that from a particular uh, distribution center sent out automatically, right? And the farm's automatically done. Imagine how that saves things. Imagine from, you know, I talk, I wrote an article about genomes and gene splitting, but imagine what that does. And we're doing it already with cows to have cows that are healthier, um, you know, and the, uh, more, more meat, less fat, those kind of things. Imagine at the same time having the capabilities on those farms, a different kind of farming, creating the meat, you know, so 3D printing of meat. Mm-hmm. So the world's, I mean, we're, we're in this incredible time where our world is shifting so quickly into an entire other realm, right? Because of the data, because of technologies are starting to advance, advance exponentially. So, and farming's kind of been on the, you know, it was, you know, I, <laughs> I literally remember growing up in Pennsylvania, uh, going down to the farm. I mean, farmers didn't make a lot of money, right? It was hard work. You get up early in the morning, you go to bed late at night, you know, and it's like, uh, it's like uh, there was a movie a long time ago called Groundhog Day. And every day, it's the same <laughs> every day. Every day is the same day. <laughs> Back in the morning, time to get up. Yeah. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> the chickens are crowing. I've heard the chickens crowing. So that's where it is. And so and we, we understand. I mean, it, we need the right kind of food at the right place at the right time. And with global warming coming, everything's going to shift. I mean, uh, Russia is going to be one of the bread baskets of the world. And so is Canada, by the way. Mm. So we're going to shift. And as we start to shift, the population will taper off. They're saying that the population right now is forecasted that today it's 8.1 billion. It'll go to about 13 billion over the next 100 years and taper off in the best case scenario. If it doesn't do that, we've got some other challenges because of the problem with non-potable water, right? We don't have the drinking water as I said this, by the way, 15 years ago, they were going to start selling water by the barrel. It's going to be like oil. People laughed at me. And I said, it's coming. Look, we're, I mean, 30 years ago, we weren't selling bottled water. Really? It was not. You would go into a restaurant, you get a tap. I don't know what it's like in Singapore, but you would get a glass of ice water and it was normal. Now you buy bottled water. It's, we don't even realize what's happening, right? Because we're going to start to have water wars. And, you know, for, you think about on a farm, I mean, water is a precious commodity. Mm. Uh, so, a lot of a lot of challenges taking place, but a lot of great opportunity uh, too. And as we start to explore the, uh, you know, the stars and and, and terra farm and hydroponics, by the way, mm -hmm. to, to be able to create those uh, environments that aren't as environmentally uh, sensitive, right? In particular right. Sit areas, we don't have to worry about it. So it's changing very very quickly. And like I said, I'm back to basics. We got to eat. <laughs> I agree with you. And yes, we got to eat. <laughs> William, over to you as well. Uh, since you're in KL, let's talk about maybe some urban farming uh, that's picking up. Uh, with Singapore is picking up as well. And I do hear uh, traces of it coming in Bangkok and in KL. So there's lots of these mini farms coming up as well. Are investors or are they getting investments that all the investments do they need? Could you kind of comment on that? Right. Uh, thanks, Terence. Okay. If you look at the uh, urban farming, um, for the last uh, two or three years, there's a lot of uh, new uh, entrants to the market providing uh, hydroponics, aquaponics, okay, uh, and sort of stack up uh, vertical farms uh, uh, for household, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, that, there's a few players in Malaysia. Uh, at this moment, they are more of still trying to educate the markets of the, the application of hydroponics, especially. Okay, so and if you look at Singapore, uh, they also encourage that uh, their citizens to, to plant some sort of uh, vertical farm in their on their balcony, for example, on the rooftop. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, but all these uh, will not excite investors because yes, if you, you do a, as a hobby or as a test uh, and error, uh, it doesn't give you the uh, the you, okay? Because uh, under uh, if you are looking at investment, investor always want consistent you, right? Be it uh, farming or be it in any kind of investment, okay? So if you look at uh, from investors' perspective and why and also. Uh, excited and jump into this business with my partner, okay, is because, number one, we want to be scalable, okay? Uh, even at this stage with the 40 footer container, we are not happy. We want to do more, okay? Because what you see behind me is actually half module. If we do in a warehouse or factory that you mentioned just now, okay, we are able to do full module at eight layers, okay? If you look mm. at, uh, in the US, we have plenty. Uh, Bovary, uh, Aero Farms. Okay, if you look at Singapore, uh, Tomasek just uh, uh, invested in a joint venture with Bayer, okay, yep. to produce uh, real industrial and commercial grade farms. Okay, this will excite investors. Okay, the, for the last uh, few weeks, uh, the moment we start uh, telling our friends, our contacts that, hey, come, come to our farm, taste the first harvest, taste the kill. The letters, the Romanian uh, letters, or or even microgreens that is uh, grown in our farm. Once mm. they taste it, they know the difference. Okay, especially our bok choy. We, our bok choy is actually uh, very tasty, very crunchy. Okay, and uh, surprisingly, it has aftertaste. And why is that? Because uh, 
with the right mix of nutrient, okay, that goes through the system, okay, and with our seeds from Netherlands, we are able to produce the, the right results. Okay, that translates to you. Okay, that translates to dollar and cents. Okay, and I mentioned just now from our original estimation of five weeks, we are able to cut one and a half weeks okay, of uh, full grown vegetable. Okay, mm. every saving of one or one and a half weeks, okay, in five cycles, we have actually additional seven and a half weeks, which you, which gives us an additional two cycle. All right, uh, from our original estimates, uh, that means our profit or our or margins will go up with the same input. Mm. Okay, so the actual learning curve is actually not uh, the technology that we use. Technology is there. We have we 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 use or adopt the best technology, the most advanced. If you look at uh, the, the the LED lights, this is a, currently uh, considered the most advanced uh, LED light that is available in the market. If you look at the nutrient mix, if you look at the entire setup in here, I think I will say that uh, what is important is actually how we make use of all this technology to produce the best you. Okay, then we can get investor excited. Okay, okay. it get me excited uh, a few months ago. That's why I quickly uh, grabbed this opportunity when it offered to me. And uh, from then on, we, 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 we just keep uh, moving forward. Great. Thanks for that, William. Uh, the numbers do matter, as always. Mm -hmm. So to all the businesses out there who are actually looking at this show and looking at the topic itself, now we are talking about factory farming, agri-tech, and some of the investments that are getting into the space itself. So I think, Tusha, uh, talk to us a little bit about some macro themes that you are seeing in the whole agri-tech scenes. I mean, uh, what's uh, getting the attention of all the investors out there? You're, you're on mute, Tusha. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So uh, there are there is actually so much to do. I mean, we are talking about uh, millions of people subsiding on agriculture and, uh, uh, you know, uh, so there is a lot of workforce involvement, a lot of climate related sensitivity. And uh, so urban farming is not a big issue out here because in any case, we have so much of rural land, which is arable. And uh, mm -hmm. so, so the main problems, you know, actually, if you look at worldwide, there has been a lot of subsidies to agriculture. We talk about trillion dollar subsidies in Europe and US. And, uh, you know, and uh, this part of the world is more suited for agriculture. But again, we also depend a lot on the government subsidies. So uh, the government has been uh, giving like $25 billion worth of farmer credit cards were issued last year. And $15 billion worth of uh, agriculture infra fund was created. And uh, uh, 40 million farmers were given insurance just in the matter of last one year. And uh, around $15 million were transferred to the bank account of around 100 million farmers in the last one year. So all these initiatives are there. But, uh, you know, if you talk specifically about some exciting technology, uh, soil and water sensors, uh, uh, they have come of age. Just as solar panels came of age and lithium ion battery came of age. Uh, so, you know, IoT powered uh, sensors, soil and water sensors have come. Then... Weather has been a big issue. Uh, uh, it affects a lot of farmers here in India. So weather tracking, uh, you know that uh, SpaceX and uh, um, this one, Cooper and OneWeb, these are the three companies which are building uh, low earth satellites. So a lot of uh, weather tracking uh, information is directly available to the farmer uh, with existing satellite systems. Then uh, we have satellite imaging to know that uh, which crop should be grown at which place. And uh, in terms of uh, easing the operational burden on the farmer uh, for use of latest technology, we call it pervasive automation. It's basically a buzz term. It refers to any technology that reduces operator payload, workload. Uh, so, and then there is RFID technology, which has been around since a long time and uh, vertical farming as uh, William was saying. So, you know, these are some of the exciting things which I've been seeing. Right, great. Right, great. And, and also from your end, Gary, I was wondering if you can kind of talk us through some specific instances or investments that you see coming from the VCs uh, 
on your side of the world. Could you give us some examples of what you've seen and why you think they invested in some of the businesses? Yeah, <clears throat> so as I said, driverless tractors, right? And mm. uh, having the capability on the farm because look at what you can do. It's one is, uh, so without getting into uh, specific details mm. uh, on it, since we're, we're a little bit uh, tied into it, um, imagine having the capability to look at it an entirely different way, not from a LIDAR perspective, but an entirely different way of being able to maneuver those tractors in the field. So that particular uh, company uh, got a significant investment because it's an emerging technology and it was able to use a whole lot of different data sources. <clears throat> and artificial intelligence is a, um, you know, quantum leap forward, you know, unsupervised AI. So mm -hmm. that's one particular uh, company that's uh, quite interesting, interesting for us. As I talked about the gene editing, gene splitting, genomes, those environments are all getting funded uh, from the Valley. And I see a lot of, um, and it, you know, the thing is Terrence, each one of these technologies, you know, the, what I like the beauty of it is they can be used in different areas. So that same mm -hmm. technology they use for the tractor can now be used in a car as a different type of more advanced way of looking at a driverless cars, not just LIDAR. So, mm -hmm. um, and when we talked about genomes, gene splitting, gene splitting, gene editing, those same technologies can be used for us for diseases, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting. So imagine being able to crop out a disease. You have cancer running, breast cancer running in your family, or prostate cancer running and being able to clip that out. So it totally doesn't exist anymore. So it, the, when I talk about transportable models, uh, it's interesting. So I see that um, uh, the vertical farming, RFID technology, internet of things, right? The internet of things, we talk about smart cities, but think about the fourth industrial revolution and smart farms, right? Having sensors everywhere and to be able to, what's it all on a farm? What's it all about? It's about the data. Mm. And so having that data and to be able to make sense of that data and act in that data is something farmers couldn't do. So what do I see? I see investments into particular areas of artificial intelligence, internet of things. I just did a panel I had the top person from Intel, the general manager of Intel worldwide for Internet of Things. We talk about smart cities, but it's more than just smart cities, right? It's about, you know, smart everything. And so uh, farms having sensors to understand, you know, how much fertilizer needs to be put in. Does this particular area need water? Uh, are there some other conditions that need to be addressed? Those kind of technologies. And again, uh, it's, more than just one area. It's what's interesting for me and why I like to invest in those areas in particular is because they're applied to all kinds of different places. And by the way, these technologies are coming from everywhere. It's not one particular region in the world. You know, and the beauty of VCTV, Terrence, is that, you know, we're addressing people from Africa, Australia, uh, Indonesia, everywhere, the US, mm. Europe, yeah. coming from everywhere, which is amazing because if you would ask me, a year ago, you know, and I lived in Russia 14 years, so I know a little bit about that region. But I mean, these technologies are coming from everywhere. It's not mm. one place anymore, which is really interesting. So mm. we're being able to mine those. I'm excited about the possibility of the broad application of the technologies. I'm not looking at one particular area in farming. By the way, when you did, and I've dealt with some you know, the Purdue's of the world, the Tyson's mm. of the world, Monsanto's of the world, uh, personally have dealt with them on the long range weather forecasting mod company that I was involved in startup. So they're not easy to deal with. It takes time because you're dealing with some fairly large um, companies, right? Mm. And, but the uh, opportunities are very exciting. Right. And, and I think we, we definitely agree with that as well. I think incorporating cross industry technologies to the current application, it definitely works and will definitely bring more yield to that matter itself. And just, just a note, uh, gentlemen of the panel today, the people viewing in are typically 
business owners, new startups, those looking for your advice and, and perhaps guidance even from your side. So, so let's talk directly to them and let's kind of give them something to work on. How would you kind of help some of the business out there who are looking to you for advice? I think uh, let's kind of just go around. Uh, William, we'll start with you with this one. Uh, how can you help some of the businesses out there who want to kind of speak to you or perhaps talk to you more about the business? Right. Uh, I think my expertise is more on structuring investments and uh, fundraising. Okay. So the reason I'm invited to participate in Agros is also to help them structure the right uh, capital uh, raising uh, mechanism. Okay. Uh, because this is uh, a startup. It's considered a startup, although uh, my partner has been in the industry for, you know, tech industry for a long time. Uh, but people still view it as a startup. So I'm here, okay, to, to make sure that uh, the investments from investors uh, or, or to start with, uh, does this investment is justifiable? How was the feasibility, the you? And then from then on, uh, I help here, uh, them to structure the, the financial modeling to ensure mm. that okay, at what point of time, how much funds we need. And for example, now uh, to build 90,000 square feet to be on par with uh, Arrow Farm uh, in Dubai or in New Jersey, we require 25 million US. Okay, but looking at the, the scale that we want to push uh, forward, okay, to meet the demand in Malaysia alone, uh, we want to invest up to 300 million US dollars. Okay, um, so how do we uh, structure this deal? How does investor feel that, oh, I'm giving you 25 million US dollars and what, what kind of return uh, 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 we are able to get? What percentage of shareholding, equity? Uh, so the, we have two... For example, for Agros, we structure in two, uh, two, two forms of investment. One is in ordinary share, uh, which is mm. equity partner. Okay, so the, we, off, we offer the up to 10% equity participation. Okay, uh, but for, for the rest who prefer to have a safe and consistent yield okay, the, on, on their investments, we provide 10% per annum. Uh, so we'll, mm. uh, every year, we'll pay out 10% coupon. Okay, and, and if uh, we are able to IPO or went on to trade sale, okay, uh, they are able to convert at a 10% per annum. Okay, that means that they have additional 10% uh, coupon uh, or, or in share value. Okay, so uh, for example, if they are able to IPO, we are able to IPO in the year five, then they, if they choose to convert, then they have 1.5 times of their investments uh, in share. Okay, so this is how we, we currently structure the deal. Okay, but for entrepreneurs who want to venture into the culture, uh, like what Gary said just now, everyone needs to eat, all right? And everyone needs to be healthy nowadays, okay? So mm. yeah, we have choice, right? Uh, if we spend the same amount of dollar, we want to have the best uh, possible value from our food, okay? Uh, in Malaysia, unfortunately, uh, our food uh, quality is uh, probably in the mid-range, okay? Uh, all the good ones go to Singapore, Okay, and uh, <laughs> and uh, some of them go to China directly. Okay, yeah. uh, like like uh, before COVID, uh, you know, in Malaysia we have we, pro we produce durians. Okay, so either yeah. you hate it or you love or you hate them or you love them. Okay, uh, before COVID, Malaysians don't have access to grade A top Musang King. Why? Because the moment they drop from the tree, they are vacuum packed and sent to China. Ah. Okay, the demand. Okay, in Malaysia, you put, we, we can eat it for maybe uh, 15 to 20 US dollars per kg. The same fruit is sold in Hong Kong for 2000 Hong Kong. Uh, in China, it's sold for uh, 1005 to 2000 renminbi. So, if I'm a businessman, I'm, of course, I'll pack and send it straight away in the container. <laughs> right? So, for, for entrepreneurs, uh, look at local demand first because uh, before you export or before you go, uh, too excited about global global food uh, shortage. Try to solve the problem in your local area. Okay, work out the yield because uh, a lot of uh, 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 produce. Uh, more importantly, is whether people want to buy or consume your produce. Okay, we mm -hmm. have a lot of wastage. A lot of uh, lower grade uh, produce are actually left to rot. Okay, right. yeah. So so I think the. Uh, entrepreneurs who want to go into agriculture business, uh, like what uh, Gary and Tushar also shared us now, 
uh, look out for the, the, the best technology for your uh, farm or for your agriculture business that you intend to do. Great. Thanks for that, William. Uh, and at least the people out there know what they're getting into when they kind of speak to us here on VCTV or kind of get right. on as well. Uh, Tusha, over to you as well with this one. Uh, we want to hear how does uh, yourself, the company, and maybe some of your peers as well, how do they normally kind of uh, fit in to this whole ecosystem with some of the entrepreneurs that come to you? So, uh, uh, you know, a lot of agri-tech companies uh, which have been coming to us, some of them sound a little bit too fancy because uh, if you are ignoring the basic aspects of Indian agriculture, which is uh, small farm holdings, lack of purchasing power of the farmer and, you know, stuff like that, then it somehow doesn't make sense to have very costly IoT sensors and very costly farm equipment and, you know, end of the day, it has to be feasible uh, business, you know, it has to make money. So unit economics are very important. But, uh, you know, within the agri chain, we are looking at uh, farm to fork uh, companies, food processing companies, companies which can reduce uh, food wastage, uh, cold storage companies are very important uh, on the supply chain, and also online trading companies. One very important theme which, uh, which we are looking at is access of credit to the farmer. So, uh, so what happens is uh, the agriculture land which the farmer is using, he's using it to grow farm produce. And farm produce, uh, these are small land holdings, so they can't really fetch that kind of a money because of the small farm holdings. So if the bank takes that uh, land as collateral, the value of that land is actually uh, the, 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 uh, the produce which grows on the land. So it is not too much. Uh, so, you know, uh, giving access of, to, uh, of credit to the farmer using fintech is, is, is a theme we are looking at very, uh, very strongly. And, uh, and there are a lot of companies, uh, very startups who are trying to solve this part of the puzzle. Uh, so, you know, lending space, credit space, uh, and technology space as a, as a whole in agri-tech looks very exciting. And there are some very exciting companies we have been seeing since the last six months. Great. Great. Thanks for that, Tusha. Gary, I think yeah. the same question to you as well. Uh, how, how different can it be? Uh, and, and how do you help some of these companies that come to you? Uh, how do you help them accelerate? Uh, you know, so the, the fundamentals are the same. You know, so what I, what I tell each one of the startups is make sure that you've done your customer discovery. By that, I mean, make sure that people really want to buy what you have, right? So mm -hmm. before you over-engineer, because one of the dilemmas that I see for all over the world is that people have an idea, but they always want to make it perfect. The problem is perfection never comes. It's just mm -hmm. like tomorrow. Tomorrow mm -hmm. never comes, right? And so what we have to do is they need to go out and test. Does somebody really want to buy their product or service? So keep it simple. Do they want to take money out of their pocket and pay for it? So how do you do that? You go out. What I've done um, re most recently with Eva, and I pivoted mm -hmm. three times with it, I actually would go out and interview people, and I had a PowerPoint presentation. And my mm -hmm. partner is a billionaire. So imagine having a billionaire walking down the street with you, interviewing people in the street in Palo Alto, California. Hey, do you mind sitting down? I'd like five minutes of your time. Mm -hmm. But that's what it's all about. And people say, well, I don't feel comfortable. But if you're founder of a company, that's your job, right? right. If you want to stay as a founder uh, or executive of a company, that's your job. Your job is to get that information mm -hmm. and to relay that information back and see if it's real. Do you need to pivot or not? So that's door number one. Door number two is I look at it as the three steps. One is acceleration, two is regional dominance, and then three is going global. And each one of them have hurdles, right? So product market fit, you know, does it work? Two is I've got regional dominance. It's really great. I believe there's a need around the world. Well, how do I go to each one of them? And the other thing is now with the pandemic, you know, it's not as easy as it was because travel is not the same. Mm. But at the same time, we've got you know, VCTV and platforms out there to be able to help us uh, understand going global. So step three is how do I get it out to the market? And that's each one of them have their own issues. The third step is really you need to trust. 
trust is built up over time when people have either invested in your products or projects and know who you are, right? Do they believe in who you are and are they willing to give you money and sure that you'll take care of their money, uh, you know, like it's your own, you know, and, and, and do the right kind of thing. So that's the third level. Are any of those easy? No. Can you optimize them to make sure that you're more successful? Absolutely. I mean, there's a book by Steve Blank and Bob Dorf called the Startup Owner's Manual. Take a look at that. It gives you some step-by-step -step instructions. And I know Bob personally and Blank use that. The lean startup approach in this particular situation works. Uh, and you can dramatically increase the probability of success, right? One of the things around the world, and we have viewers from everywhere, as I found, uh, and as I said, I lived in Russia 14 years. One of the things that, you know, failure is not a good thing, but when you're pivoting, it doesn't mean you're failing. You, it's like going down the road and taking the wrong turn. You just mm. make a new turn and turn around and take the right turn. So making sure that, you know, a lot of people give up too early, mm. right? So if they believe in what they have, believe in their dreams, the thing is you need to figure it out. That's where the successful entrepreneurs, forward thinking entrepreneurs uh, really have it, you know, hands on better than uh, anybody else. They believe in their dreams. They visualize where they want to go. So it's kind of the soft side of being an entrepreneur. And it's never easy, Terrence. Let me tell you, building a startup is never easy. If somebody says it is, they're lying. I mean, I talked to, you know, Slack, right? So mm. I had a conversation with Stuart uh, probably two years ago. And he told me, you know, when they built Slack, it was a gaming company. And they retransitioned it over because they had this internal tool they were using for projects, Slack. Mm. And so, you know, he said, and the smart, I'll never forget it. And this is before Slack. Well, it was four years ago, actually. It was before Slack really took off. And he said, I hope those people kept their stocks that he had to let go of a lot of people in his company. <laughs> and now they just got sold. Right. So yeah. I, he said then, I hope they kept their stock and he's a nice guy. So the key is you got to pivot sometimes. Right. And that's just part right. of the game. So right. anyhow, uh, but think globally. Great. And I think, uh, you on the panel as well, you can kind of chime in and help some of this business do that. And for those of you watching us now, from wherever you are, again, there is an opportunity to, for you to participate as well. Come on board, talk to us, talk to some of the investors, talk to the people you see now in front of you as well, because they are the ones with that knowledge, with that bank behind them almost, and also with that opportunity to kind of take your business forward, whether you're in blockchain or not, I think the priority is definitely to kind of look at you first. So uh, we have a few minutes left, actually just two minutes left on the show. I'm just going to go around and have you kind of speak directly to the audience itself. Uh, tell them any last words or any plugs that you want to fit in. William, let's start with you. Well, uh, everyone, uh, if you plan to start an agriculture business, uh, please do so because uh, it fits the world, it fits people, okay? And also you're contributing to, uh, to social good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, William. And Thank that's you. definitely a good point as well. Tisha, over to you. Uh, so, you know, uh, any agri-tech company uh, wanting to make a mark, uh, be it on the impact side or on non-impact, fully profitable, both the streams, most welcome, take money from us, uh, $5 million, $10 million, $15 million. And uh, <laughs> so, so what I'm trying to just say is that uh, mostly, you know, I welcome agri-tech. Uh, you know, it's a good space to be in just like education and healthcare. And it uh, does good for a lot of people. And uh, one can be a part of a movement uh, along with earning money. So most welcome to all startups. Great. Great. Gary, Gary, help us sum it up. Talk to yeah, the people. So, <laughs> thanks, Terrence. So this is the greatest opportunity that we've ever had. This is like the beginning of the 20th century and AI is the new electricity. I encourage each and every one of the companies out there to move forward, to believe in your dreams, to take that step, you know, 
to not look back. I remember one time I had the chance of meeting with a writing man at Rupert Murdoch, one of the wealthiest guys on the planet. And he said that, you know, what is the, what are the keys to success? So we're having dinner in California with the brother of the founder of Google, um, Carl Page. And I said, what, give me one thing. And he said, amnesia. He's, and I said, what do you mean amnesia? He said, they never talk about the past. He said, I've interviewed 3,000 top entrepreneurs in the world. They never talk about the past. So believe in your dream, go forward and make your own dent in the universe. And it is possible, right? It's never easy, but it yeah. is possible. If you visualize, if you believe in your dreams, you know, and, and keep moving up uh, uh, positively. So those are the soft sides of it. You can reach me, Gary Fowler, GSD Venture Studios. Get shit done, Venture Studios, because that's what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Gary. And thank you for summing it up for us as well. Gentlemen on the panel, again, I appreciate your advice and insights on the show today. Do come back on to the next shows. Uh, and for those watching us from wherever you are, again, this is VCTV. My name is Terrence. Thank you for joining us and come back the next time around. Bye-bye, everybody.